Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer. Scripture teaches that when we are Out of fellowship, it is in an unsanctified state, which needs to be corrected. Sanctification, in terms of the experience of the Christian life, the ongoing day-to-day walk, simply means to be cleansed of sin, prepared for service of the Lord. So we need to be in fellowship, and Scripture teaches that when we confess our sins, which means simply admitting or acknowledging them to God the Father, then when we acknowledge them, admit them, confess them, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, that is, those we just mentioned, but also to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, so that having been cleansed, we are restored to fellowship, we recover the ongoing filling ministry of God the Holy Spirit, walking so that we can walk in the light, walk by means of the Holy Spirit, and thus begin to grow or continue our spiritual growth. So we'll begin with a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to look at these things in Scripture, to reflect upon how we think, what we think, and how this impacts our own Christian life and how our own the way in which we look at life and interpret life. Father, we pray that as we study these things in Jude, that we can take it to heart, the injunction of Jude 3, that we are to contend earnestly for the faith, and that begins in terms of our own soul, first and foremost. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. All right, back to Jude. Jude, and this time, I'm just going to pick up where I left off last time with a little bit of review. I want to look at uh, this whole idea of how you and I can develop a framework, a grid, a, a a tool for evaluating how we think, and we all grow up in a in a culture, in a worldview. There are broad cultures, for example, an American culture versus a European culture versus a Chinese or Asian culture or Hispanic culture. And even within those broader cultural spectrums, there are subcultures. In the United States, there are a variety of subcultures. Some are regional. People in California may think or act or respond differently than people in Texas. People in Texas are going to be different from New Yorkers. Uh, New Yorkers are going to be different from somebody in, let's uh, let's say, Athens, Georgia, Uh, So people have these regional differences in the way in which they look at things, uh, but there are also ethnic subcultures. You have a uh, a black or African-American subculture. You have a Hispanic subculture, Asian subcultures. And even within those subcultures, there there will be distinctions depending on whether or not groups are, are Christian or not. And so there are all these different views, and as you might think of them as somebody putting on a set of glasses. And now where do we get those glasses? Well, those glasses were formed in our thinking through the influence of a variety of things, the influence of our parents, influence of peers growing up, influence of teachers, influence from media. Today, Even in Christian homes, there's a huge impact upon your children through media. And there's a lot of debate uh, among different groups as to how that should be handled. There are those who want to completely shelter 
their children from the inputs of the world so they uh, don't have very much television, don't allow very much television. They homeschool or put them in Christian schools with an attempt to try to isolate the children. And on the positive side, they're not just isolating them from the world. They're trying to build that biblical worldview, build and teach Christian character so that as they get older, when they are introduced more and more to the culture around them, then they have the tools and the skills and the maturity to be able to uh, deal with and interact with that culture. And ideally, and I've seen many cases of this, when parents are doing this well, then what they are doing is they are uh, not uh, completely isolating their children from the cultural stream, but they are picking and choosing uh, when those their children are exposed to certain trends in the culture, and then they help set the framework mentally ahead of time, uh, use the opportunity to teach children how they should think and interact with what they're hearing, what they're listening to, so that there is a protective, an intellectual and spiritual protection or defense built up so that when children hear the message of the world system, then they will be able to put up a, a wall or barrier and filter it. Uh, this is a taught, and we have to always remember in the Bible that there are two ways of looking at life. There's God's viewpoint, and then there is the creature's viewpoint. Now, I'm going to call it creature's viewpoint here. Sometimes I refer to it as human viewpoint. Sometimes we refer to it with a biblical term, worldly thinking, or cosmic with a K, cosmic thinking from the Greek word cosmos. Uh, sometimes we may refer to it as satanic or demonic thinking. It all refers to the same thing. There are numerous different aspects to this kind of thinking. Uh, at the very core, uh, uh, as I've emphasized, there's two aspects. One is autonomy, that the creature can define or understand reality independently of God's crea- uh, God the Creator and how He has uh, revealed that creation operates, and also antagonism. There's a... a, a antagonism or hostility to to God's Word. And those elements run through things. So whether you're talking about various religious systems, whether you're talking about non-Christian religious systems, whether it's Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, uh, Baha'ism, Islam, uh, any of these isms, uh, whether it's talking about a religion or you're talking about philosophical systems such as secularism, humanism, existentialism, modernism, postmodernism, Darwinism, Freudianism, all these other isms, that these are all uh, different manifestations of the basic fundamental principles of, uh, of uh, autonomy and antagonism. And so they may manifest differently in different cultures. And we need to understand that because all of us have picked up ideas. And we have, it's, it's as if it's in the water that we drink. And your children have them. That's why you see children, children today, uh, young people today, people under the age of 30, often react to many different, th- to different events. They act very differently from their parents. And some of that is because of the trends of the day. And those trends are determined by intellectual influences. And for, for one example, often today, uh, those who are have come up through school, come up through uh, college, uh, university, are constantly here that uh, something like that, that the free market system has failed, the capitalism has failed, that government is the solution to the problem. And when they are in high school and university and they're taking economics classes, political science classes, they constantly hear this, over, this drumbeat over and over and over again. And if that's never countered and if there's no alternative view, then, then they just pick it up. They don't know any other way to think. And so that there really needs to be a preparation. Same thing with Darwinism. Again and again, they hear, not just in the science classroom, but they hear in liberal arts, they hear in sociology, they hear in 
in uh, social studies that the earth is billions of years old. And they hear this over and over and over and over again. And unless there's something there that's going to say, mm, no, you're wrong, it's not. I'm not going to challenge you. You're the teacher, but I'm not buying into this. There has to be that grid that goes up there. Uh, James 3.15 says that uh, the wisdom of the world it de- describes it with the terms earthly, natural, which really means soulish uh, as opposed to spiritual, and demonic. So the wisdom that belongs to this world is earthly, it is soulish or related to the thinking of the unbeliever, and it is classified as demonic because it is a reflection of Satan's, Satan's system of thought. And so this is what lies behind the infiltration of any kind of false ideas, any kind of false teaching. And always remember this, ideas are important because ideas have consequences. And even if you don't fully comprehend or understand all of the consequences, when we have wrong ideas, they will always lead to bad consequences. And by bad consequences, I don't necessarily see, say something immediate that is going to be uh, catastrophic or drastic, drastically negative. In fact, for many years, it may appear to work, but in the end, it produces a life that is empty and without God, a life that has no spiritual value or significance, and a life that is, if they are unbelievers, destined to the lake of fire, and if a believer, then it is destined to an evaluation judgment at the judgment seat of Christ where there is nothing left. So what we have to do, as I've stated in the title here, uh, previously I called it identifying worldly thinking in our own souls, but we need to do more than that. We need to be able to understand where this came from. And, and part of this is just being more cognizant of the ideas that are out there and how it has impacted our, uh, our culture. And in the United States and Western Europe, there's been a huge culture shift, a term that uh, scholars and philosophers use a lot as a paradigm shift. A paradigm, paradigm is a model for something. And this paradigm shift that actually occurred in the early part of the 20th century, but it didn't filter down from the uh, intellectual elite. It didn't filter down in terms of their impacts on college, university, classrooms, etc., until after World War II. These ideas were there before, but it was in a, in a small spectrum of the, of the culture. But as those ideas were promoted more and more, uh, through various media means and educational means, it began to filter down and it began to reach sort of a critical mass in terms of the uh, education leaders by the time you get into uh, the 1960s and uh, especially the 1970s. And then uh, when that generation had taught uh, those students, now those students from the baby boom generation, have all imbibed of the, this kind of thinking. Then they carried it to the next level, and it just really reaches uh, explosive proportions by the late 70s and on up to the, uh, to the present day. So we need to identify that. The principle in Jude is that we are to contend earnestly for the faith, which is a ter- term that has to do with a, a fighting uh, it's, a, it's an uh, athletic term. It means that we are to strive for something. We need to make it a priority. It needs to be something that we intensely struggle against on a day-to-day basis. There's the assumption in Scripture that there is a set body of truth that is true, not just for you, not just for me, not just for the next person, but not just for Americans and not just for uh, Europeans, but is true for all people at all times. And we have to know that and de- de- defend it uh, so that it is part of our uh, makeup, our culture, and our understanding. So that's the word pistis for faith, and it is a content of what we believe. Now, this goes, what we believe goes into our thinking, and there's three circles I talked about. First of all, we evaluate our own thinking. Then we have the thinking that is in the sub sub subculture, the micro subculture of our family unit. Now, if you live in a, a home where there's only one parent, 
Uh, that's going to be a different kind of subculture than a home where there are are, are two parents. If you live in a home where uh, parents are uh, uh, firmly committed to the truth of God's Word and in training children, that culture is going to be different from uh, another culture. And so we have that culture where we have to uh, root out these uh, worldly demonic ideas. And then in a, the next area is the church, and the next area, of course, is outside of that. But we usually don't have the opportunity to get too involved in the broader cultural, uh, broader cultural level. I also talked about the fact that first, that Second Corinthians ten five and six emphasizes that we are to be engaged in casting down arguments. That means you have to know what the arguments are. You have to know the other guy's position. You have to know what the views are out there. You can't cast down an argument if you don't know what it is. Uh, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Why? In order to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Not most thoughts, not some thoughts, but every thought. So I don't know about you, but my brain's capable of cranking out a lot of thoughts, and so is yours. Even though you may not use it very well, you still generate a lot of thoughts, ideas, opinions. And this applies to every one of those thoughts, every opinion that you have, every belief that you have, every value that you have has to be taken out and exposed in the light of God's Word, and then you have to uh, either uh, remove it or reinforce it from the truth. We start with inside of ourselves. Jesus lays down this principle in Matthew 7, 3 through 5, where he said, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? See, it's real easy to walk around, point to other Christians, and say, They just don't get it. They, they, they just don't understand. Look at that person. They, they have uh, one and a half legs in the world, and they just have their little pinky over in, in doctrine. Uh, we look at people and we say, they're just, they just don't get it in terms of the importance of, of, of doctrine. But my question to you is, do you get it in terms of the importance of, of doctrine? Is it just the academic understanding or the, 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 the end result of taking in doctrine, which teaches you not just what to believe, but how to apply it and how it changes you from the inside out, are you paying attention uh, to doctrine and changing. So Jesus said, why do you look at the speck, this little bitty problem over in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank or the log or the, the huge uh, eight by ten that's in your own eye? He goes on to say, how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck let me from your eye? In other words, let me straighten out your problem and look a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first, first, in terms of order, remove the plank from your own eye. Now, that is, he's talking uh, in terms of a, a metaphor there. He says, first, you need to straighten out the problem in your own life, in your own thinking. Don't start, don't go around meddling in everybody else's life until first you have done the in-depth uh, house cleaning necessary in your own thinking and in your own soul. So that's why we're starting with, with uh, what w- the influence of the world on our own thinking. Now, as a foundation, and I keep going over this again, I want to go over some of these charts uh, so many times that you dream about them in your sleep. So don't just get bored, tune out, or whatever. We have four ways that people come to know truth that humans have have articulated that you come to know truth. The top three are limited. They're limited because man's they're all based on human thought systems, on the human mind, and they're all putting their faith completely and totally in human ability to decipher and interpret uh, things either intellectually or experientially. And yet many, many times we know less than one one millionth of one percent about something, and yet we think that because we know that, we can uh, project uh, everything else. So these views are rationalism, which means that we can reason our way 
based on just logical principles and rational assumptions to ultimate truth. Empiricism, the starting point's different. Rationalism's starting point is a basic first principle in your mind. In empiricism, it's what we see, see, taste, touch, feel, smell. It's experience. Usually there's a combination of these two. That's the scientific method, a combination of rationalism and empiricism. But they're both, as you see in the right column, grounded on an independent use of logic and reason. Uh, There's nothing wrong with logic and reason, but we've got to determine whether it's reason and logic operating independently of God's Word or dependently upon God's Word. And in the top three, it's in these top two, it's independent of God's Word. Then in the last category, in mysticism, this rejects logic. Mysticism just goes with inner impressions, inner ideas. And everybody has these. And it's real easy for a lot of Christians to somehow want to identify uh, some thought that comes into their mind as, well, that came from the Holy Spirit. Well, see, unbelievers have those kinds of things, too. We have so much that happens inside of our thinking. The, the, The human mind is such an incredible computer that's processing billions and billions of pieces of data all the time, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. And every now and then it just spits this stuff out and it comes to the, it rises to our consciousness. Now, I believe that in the Christian life, many times the Holy Spirit is behind that. But not always. Sometimes it's just the process of our own thought mechanisms. And sometimes we we can't really identify the difference between the normal thought processes and a time when God the Holy Spirit has just uh, slipped that out there for us to pay attention to. And so some people go way too far, and every time something like this happens, it was, it was God the Holy Spirit who did it. How do you know? That's the question. How do you know? What is, are the clear, objective, discerning uh, criterion for determining whether a thought or an idea that came into your mind is from God the Holy Spirit or not. Uh, So we have to be very careful with that. We have to be careful that we don't cross a line there into some sort of new revelation. So uh, I believe that uh, God the Holy Spirit works way back behind the scenes. He's, um, He's influencing us, but we don't know and we can't identify when it's directly the Holy Spirit or indirectly the Holy Spirit. We just know that he, he does that. So, so people who run around and they always have to say, well, Jesus did this or the Holy Spirit told me this. Whatever. How, how do you know? I mean, I, I'm not saying God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus aren't, aren't involved indirectly in some of these things, but the issue is how do you know? So mysticism, though, leads to an autonomy in the human mind that that uh, my, that glorifies my inner impressions, ideas, uh, uh, thought flashes, insights, and uh, generates levels raises that to the level of uh, the same level of authority as as revelation, the Word of God. Now, in contrast to those top three, we have the bottom section, which is revelation. Uh, some some um, sometimes I've seen. Writers call this authority, and that's what it is. The authority is in an, a, a person outside of our mind. See, rationalism, empiricism, mysticism all take place inside your head, but this takes place outside. Some external authority tells you what is true. Now, when this, this operates in a limited way all the time. When you have a young child and you start teaching them the alphabet and to read, they, 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 they just listen to you and base their belief on what you say. You tell them that that's right, this is wrong, and they just believe an authority. They aren't using their experience or their reason to go to that. They're just basing it on, on an external authority. Well, that is what the Christian does in trusting the Bible. We believe God is omniscient. And he knows all things. He, he doesn't drop anything. He doesn't miss anything. 
He has revealed himself to us, and so we use that authoritative uh, revelation to help us interpret the data, the details, the experiences of our life. Always remember this. You evaluate your experience by the Word of God. So when you go in the hospital and you have an out-of-body experience and want to assign some spiritual value to it because it just seemed so real to you, the word of and you think you went to heaven, you come back and want to tell everybody about it. You have to remember that the apostle Paul went to heaven and 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 God and God said, Well, you can't tell anybody about it. So are you raising yourself to a level above the Apostle Paul? How do you know? Oh, it just seemed that way. Oh, I've never felt that way before. This, these are the arguments you'll hear. It was, oh, you just had to have been there. That that is a that is an irrational argument. But that's where we are in our culture today is because reason or rationalism hasn't, has debunked Scripture. Empiricism has debunked Scripture. They're not right, but they have debunked Scripture so that people say, oh, oh intellectually, intellectual, I just, I, 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 I'm not sure I can really believe the Bible. I, I have to have some evidence other than the Bible to know that it's true. That's true. And there's a case in point that, that happened just um, not too long ago. There's a, a book out there that uh, is written by a pastor. Oh, it must have credibility. He's a good pastor. Uh, I think he may even be a Baptist pastor. Oh, he must be. He's good. And his little boy, who can doubt a little boy? And his uh, little boy had, was in the hospital. It was a life-threatening situation. He has a has a near-death experience, goes to heaven. He comes back and he tells all these different things about what he saw in heaven. I think that uh, he, he, people have gone through and analyzed the book, and there are 33 different things that he says ha- happened in heaven. Well, 16 of them were told these are the kind of things that happen in heaven, but we get that from the Bible. The others that are listed there... Uh, the others that are listed that aren't in the Bible. So how do we know he's true or he could just be hallucinating? Uh, it could be some something that happens in that chemical uh, imbalance that occurs under certain kinds of stress and whatever, and the brain is having all these kind of explosive little things that are going on, bringing into his brain things that he has has heard or heard about or dreamt about or imagined and then they become part of this particular, uh, this particular vision. Are we going to say this little boy's experience is the ultimate authority, and therefore I know that heaven exists? Well, we go back to Luke chapter 16 when we have the story about uh, Lazarus and the, the rich man. Let's just look at this for just a brief second. Uh, le- uh, Luke, Luke chapter 16. This is the episode where you have uh, the rich man by the name of uh, uh, by the name of of uh, that he's just called the rich man, and then there is a beggar, a homeless person who lives out under the nearby bridge by the name of Lazarus, and he's he's a beggar. He's not physically attractive. He has all sorts of uh, uh, physical hygiene problems. He's not very sanitary. The food he eats isn't very good. He's a dumpster diver. And uh, uh, he dies eventually. And when the beggar dies, he's carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. This is what happens when we die. The angels escort us to paradise, which is now in heaven. But at this time, before Jesus died on the cross, it was... uh, Somewhere, it seems, in the earth. So the angels carry him to Abraham's bosom. And not long after that, the rich man who drove his Rolls Royce by the the streetlight where this homeless guy uh, uh, begged for money and wanted to wash his windshield all the time, uh, where the rich man uh, ignored him. And now the rich man dies. and, And the difference between the two is that Lazarus, this Lazarus, and this isn't the Lazarus of uh, Mary and Martha's uh, family. This is another Lazarus. That this man is a believer, and so he goes to heaven. But the rich man's an unbeliever, so he goes uh, to torments, which is another segment of Hades. And when um, the rich man 
comes to consciousness in his interim body and uh, torments, he looks across this great gulf and he can see, which tells us he has some sort of visual capability, he can see uh, Lazarus on the other side. But he can also tell that the people on the other side are not in fiery torment. And so he cries out to Father Abraham, who seems to be in, Abraham seems to be in charge of all of this, and says, uh, send Lazarus, or at least Abraham's in charge of the other side, paradise, says, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in the flame. So that tells us a little bit about it, what it was like, and that there is some sort of interim physical uh, body or an interim spiritual body that has physical sensations. And Abraham says to, to the rich man, who was a young rich man, he says, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, you're tormented, besides all this between us and you is a great gulf fix, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot. Then the rich man begs him again, says, send, send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Of course, he's thinking they're going to believe somebody who's been raised from the dead because uh, of the miracle. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. What could be more authoritative than Moses and the prophets? Someone's experience? No. Uh, The experience of talking to someone raised from the dead is not your authority. The ultimate authority is the Word of God. Everything else is, is, is much less. It is insignificant. If they don't believe the authority of the Word of God, then they'll never believe that somebody has actually been raised from the dead. If, that's verse 31. He said, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And so what's more important, what's the ultimate authority? It's what the Word of God says. The Word of God judges your experience. No matter how real that experience may be, you have to go to the Word of God and let the Word of God tell you what that experience really is. Because your mind, your heart is evil and wicked and deceptive above all things, Jeremiah says. Who can know it? So we have, in contrast to human limited systems of knowledge, now, by that, I don't. I, I want to remind you once again: you can't come to true, true truth, little, tr- little t, through on the basis of rationalism, empiricism, and maybe uh, uh, myst- mysticism. But it's not ultimate truth; it's not absolute truth; it's not uppercase truth. Now, we saw last time also the historical flow. Uh, Descartes and Locke in modern times, proponents of rationalism and empiricism, both failed. Immanuel Kant points out the problem. You can't get to uh, a clear argument for objective knowledge, so you come back to subjectivism. The only, all you know is what you see. And how many times have you heard people say this? Well, that's just your experience. All you can know is what your experience tells you. You can't know things as they are. Uh, you can't know things... Uh, as they are objectively. And this is skepticism. But people can't live as skeptics. They can't, when, 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 when it gets really tough and somebody's about to murder you, or you're in the trench of warfare, like the old saying, there's no atheist in the trenches, you cry out to God, the most committed atheist, because there's that they, they've suppressed the truth, but it's always wanting to pop out in, um, in different ways. So in existentialism, you have to find meaning somewhere because God created you to, be a, to, to have meaning. And in existentialism, you just validate your meaning by doing something. Now, all of this uh, basically traces out the, uh, uh, the history of thought from the early 1700s through the uh, 19th century. And then we have... And primarily in the 19th century, we have postmodernism. The previous is called modernism. So after modernism becomes bankrupt and can't really give answers anymore, all it does is produce the horrors of World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, 
we have to turn to something else to find hope and meaning. So I got into some postmodern basics last time. Truth is created, not discovered. Uh, reason, rationality, and science are cultural biases. Uh, those who trust reason and things based on reason, like science, Western civilization, education, the U.S. Constitution, etc., are just biases from uh, European cultural conditioning. And this cultural conditioning is designed to keep power in the hands of the social, uh, social elite. I think we went through this, this chart. Uh, the subject, uh, I'm going to com- compare and contrast biblical Christianity with modernism and postmodernism. In, in uh, modernism, or in biblical Christianity, mankind's created the image of God. He's not an accident. There's design and purpose. And man is both a physical and a spiritual being. In postmodernism, humans are purely a, or excuse me, in modernism, humans are uh, uh, purely a material machine. The universe is purely physical. Nothing exists beyond our senses. In postmodernism, they, they really don't address this. They're suspicious of any dogmatic assertion. You can't know truth. Oh, is that a truth? Wow, well, we don't know. That's the basic problem with postmodernism. There's no set universal truth. In terms of free will, biblical Christianity says that it's diminished by sin, but human beings are still morally responsible. And modernism says that man is completely independent and autonomous and self-governing. They can choose their own direction in postmodernism. We're products of our own culture. We only imagine that we're self-governing. You're basically predetermined by your culture. You believe what you believe because you were raised in a Christian culture. If you were raised in a Buddhist culture, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be a Buddhist. You're determined by your, shaped by your culture. It's the determinative factor. That's why we have multicult- what's called multiculturalism. And uh, biblical Christianity, reason is necessary, but not the sole or ultimate basis for understanding reality. It discovers some truth. But revelation is also needed. And in modernism, rationalism and empiricism become the only basis for discovering truth. Completely rejects the possibility of external revelation. And postmodernism denies objective reason. Reason doesn't really get you there. It's, it's impossible. Neither does experience. And uh, rationalism for them is it's, it's just a myth. Uh, you're just deceiving yourself. You just go with your... Whatever you want, you, you go with something that is, what? Irrationalism, as I pointed out earlier. Uh, in terms of the view of progress, biblical Christianity says mankind isn't progressing toward anything. Advances, technological advances are positive, but there's no utopia to be brought in because inherently we live in a fallen world. In modernism, there's this, this belief in, in a utopic possibility Man is getting better and better every day in every way. And science and reason are the path to perfection. But science and reason brought us the atomic bomb, so maybe it's not so good, so maybe it won't get us anywhere, so it's bankrupt. And postmodernism comes along and denies the objectivity of reason, that rationalism is just a myth, and uh, we can only uh, get to any kind of utopia if we, uh, if we just uh, believe whatever we want to believe. So how do we get this way? It, it has to do with, with a mindset. It, it's that we're all, it, it sort of describes uh, what some have called a compartmentalization in the brain. And that compartmentalization is something we, we're sort of taught from the worldview. Uh, as I was saying earlier, a worldview is like a set of glasses, and those glasses are put together by uh, the culture around us, parents, peers, uh, educators, professors. And the media has a huge role today, a uh, huge role. And as I said, you know, there's parents who try to restrict their children from being exposed to a lot of this media because they understand that that media, uh, the media is part of the problem and it's part of the uh, means of promoting the problem. It's both. Some people want to say, well, it's all because of the media. No, it's sort of a a, a, a self-reinforcing cycle. The media is part of the problem, but the media is also the channel. Uh, It's also the highway on which these ideas uh, move, and so uh, it, we we ought to restrict ourselves from the influence 
of media. And when, with the internet, this is just it's put all this influence of the media on st- on just on steroids. Uh, your kids are out there on Facebook, and they're out there on um, on many of these other uh, social networking apps, and spending huge amount of times. You know, they're texting and all these things. I'm not th- saying those things are wrong, but there's a time and a place for everything. And this is a huge, huge distraction. And it, it takes peer pressure to a, a quantum leap uh, further than it was when uh, many of us were at that age. Okay, and this next chart, what I want to describe, is just basically what happened since 1900 with Immanuel Kant. He, he had this, uh, this view of reality that he splits. And so we're going to talk about these two areas of reality. The lower level is the area of the details of life, of uh, what we see, what we experience, what we taste, touch, feel, the areas of, cr- uh, of creation, the created order, the physical order. And so this is comprised of people and observable phenomena, uh, things, uh, events, language. All of this is is what's going on in downstairs in this house. And then upstairs we have universals, the uh, I- moral ideas, ethics, absolutes, the idea of God. Uh, all of this is upstairs. And notice there's a staircase here where we can go upstairs and look at the broad universal absolutes, the broad universal ideas, and those can help us to understand and to organize uh, the details of life that are downstairs. And there's movement. Uh, We can see what's upstairs. We can know it directly. And as Christians, we believe that, that we can know God, that God can speak to us, and that there is communication between the universals and what's down below. Now, what happens with Immanuel Kant is he came along and said, no, we, we, don't have, we, can't, we can't validate this on the basis of logic and reason alone. We can't validate this philosophically. And so all we can do is see what we what we think we see. We don't know if there's what's on the other side because we have no direct experience of it. We have no direct contact with it. And so we don't know if, if it's there. So you can't really know that there are universals. You can only guess. And so after Immanuel Kant, uh, it's the upstairs is just becomes inaccessible. But the problem is we live downstairs in a world that now intellectually has no meaning, no God, and we're in existential darkness and despair. So this is where uh, Friedrich Nietzsche ends up. It's just it's just nihilism. I mean, there's no meaning in life. There's no value. Just existential darkness. And we're all just products of some uh, cosmic accidental spark that hit a uh, a protoplasmic pool and something happened and eventually uh, it ends up being one of us. But we're all just pure matter. There's There's no immaterial soul. There's no God. There's no ultimate accountability. There's nothing. We're just trapped in this physical existence. So we just come up with all of our values are just pragmatic. They're just consensus. And so one culture may have their consensus, another culture may have their consensus, but who's to say one culture is better than another culture? Who's to say the culture of New Yorkers is any better than the cultures of the Aztecs under Montezuma in the 16th century? Who's to say that there's anything wrong with cannibalism? Who's to say there's anything wrong with human sacrifice? Who were those horrible Europeans anyway to think they could come in and in that culture. And so now, now you see history and politics and law all dumps on groups that have come in and supplanted uh, other groups and said that their ideas were wrong. 
And so the evil ones are now those who have been the conquerors. Yet those conquerors were coming in with, to one degree or another with generally Christian ideas. And it was when Christian ideas came into the pagan barbarian Roman Empire, transformed Roman culture, and had the birth of a Christian Europe. And changes, otherwise Europeans would have been no different from the pagan barbarians uh, everywhere else. Now, this impacts young people. It impacts uh, them all, everywhere. And the result of certain surveys are that 68% or 66% uh, of young people, 66% believe that no such thing as absolute truth exists. Now, you, you, we all know that there's an inherent contradiction there because they say no absolute truth exists. Well, that's an absolute truth. So there's an inherent contradiction there, but it doesn't matter because they, in the very core of their being, they have bought into this idea that that it it doesn't have to be logical. In fact, logic hasn't helped us any. So who cares if it's logical? This is the way it is. No, and so there's no such thing as absolute truth. Seventy percent, seventy-two percent of those. I mean, sixty-six percent of Americans believe there's no such thing as absolute truth. Seventeen. 72% of those between 18 to 25. Now, this particular survey came, uh, came, out of, uh, came out earlier, about 10 or 12 years ago. So these 18 to 25-year-olds are now 28 to 35. So we're talking about the under 40 generation here. 72% of those between eight, between, probably between 40 and younger don't believe that there are any absolutes whatsoever. But here's something that, that'll shock you. 53% of evangelicals, these are people who think they're Christian, who claim to be Christian, who claim to believe the Bible is the ultimate authority in their life. 53% of evangelicals believe that there are no ab- absolutes, that not even Christ is an absolute. Well, you say, well, that's contradictory. Well, see, in, in postmodernism is all about contradiction. It is irrationalism uh, gone to seed. So this has led to several consequences. For example, it's led to the collapse of the importance of religious belief. And we see that in our secular culture. There's been this drastic divorce of the secular from the spiritual. And so we live in a world where many of our intellectual elites, those who are uh, who are extremely influential in policy. They don't even have elected roles. They are in positions of think tanks. They're intellectuals who operate uh, behind the scenes in media and control these things. They don't believe it, that religious ha- that there's anything true about religious ideas. Now, where does this have a consequence? Well, it has a consequence when you're dealing with Islam, for example. And in Islam... They, they don't have this split between the sacred or the spiritual and, and the uh, secular. Everything is about Allah, and everything is about uh, getting the world ready for uh, Allah to come and, and to cleanse the world and to bring about the death of all the Christians and all of the Jews. So they take that extremely seriously. But see, secular atheists in the West, oh, that's just a myth. You know, we don't take that seriously. But they do. So because we're blinded by secularism, we can't honestly understand or appreciate where our Islamic enemy uh, is coming from. And so we're going to miss many good decisions, we're going to make many bad decisions, and maybe even some self-destructive decisions, because we can't really comprehend the way they think, because it means nothing to the secular elites in our culture. It leads to globalism. Uh, Globalism, everybody's equal, everybody's good, everybody's... You can't draw distinctions, evaluations, judgments between some cultures are better than other cultures. You're left just saying that the... um, uh, cannibals of one location are just as good and just as beneficial to humanity as uh, the intellectual elites at Harvard. Well, maybe not at Harvard. You've got to make some exceptions, I guess. Um, so this leaves us with a fragmentation 
and a complete polarization in terms of our culture. We have on the one side those who believe in absolutes and on the other side those who don't. And, and that, that's not necessarily between Christian and non-Christian because we still have large elements of our culture that may not be biblical, they may not be truly justified, but they have still been inculcated with a biblical worldview. And they think that way. They think in terms of external universals and absolutes. And then on the other side, you have those who don't. And, and, and the, the, the space between them becomes uh, greater and greater as we go through time. And this has led to why there's so, so many complaints about the fact that there's little civil discourse in political debates. And one of the reasons for that is because the more polarized the culture becomes, the more frustrated people become with the other side and the more hostile they become uh, to, the other, to the other side. So there's this extreme breakup, fragmentation uh, of our culture. And we can see this right now because with the recent emphasis on uh, homosexual sodomite marriage, and the legalization of it in the announcement by our president that he believes that's the right thing. Notice how he said, and I think it's right as a Christian to treat all these people well. They've been disenfranchised. Well, wait a minute. What Bible is he reading? Christianity gets its truth and its values from the Bible. And the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin and it's not to be legitimized or validated by uh, legal statute. So we have this fragmentation, polarization that occurs in the culture wars, and it is seen in the split still between North and South. Notice that right before he made that announcement, there was a uh, the vote in North Carolina which overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly affirmed traditional marriage, rejected any kind of same-sex marriage, and also rejected civil unions. By, like, by a vote of like 70%. So he comes along the next day, makes this announcement that he really thinks that same-sex marriage is the, is, is the right thing to do. So we have uh, North Carolina, Virginia's passed a um, uh, Defense of Marriage Act. I believe Georgia has across the South. I'm not sure about, about uh, Florida. But, but notice the states that have done this are the states that still have a strong biblically conservative evangelical uh, population. It's influenced by the Bible. The rest of the country, uh, and especially in the Northeast, have thrown the Bible away years ago. They don't even know what a Bible looks like. They, they, most of the people up there who are influencing things have never met an evangelical Christian, have never read the Bible, have probably never read the Ten Commandments, and don't even know where to find them if they... Uh, if they were interested. So if, according to this group, um, human beings make up their own reality. And so who's to say one reality is better than another? Who's to say that a heterosexual reality is better than a homosexual reality? Who's to say that, that uh, uh, feminism is better than patriarchalism? Who, who's to say that the American way of life as seen in our Constitution, which promotes a free enterprise, who's to say that's better than socialism? Just because socialism didn't, has never worked historically doesn't mean it won't work for us. It's so arrogant they're blinded uh, to the truth. So every reality is true. Now, so we, what we're seeing here is that in postmodernism, uh, meaning is created by a social group and it's language. This is why language becomes so important, the words that are used. According to postmodernism, therefore, it's impossible to know God or to know history or to know reason. You can't get up upstairs. There's a solid wall there. So we just make things up. We make Every culture makes up myths and legends about God, history, and reason just to just to promote their own agenda, just to validate their own ideas. So you can't trust those people who go to history and say, oh, we need to go back to the Constitution. Well, that was their reality in 1700. What does that have to do with us today? It's a living document. Who cares whether it's constitutional or not? So with these people, it's 
in postmodernism, it's impossible to communicate truth because at, at a core level, they can't quite comprehend that. Uh, with no absolutes behind language, according to them, each person is trapped and imprisoned by their own language or culture or group that seeks to marginalize them. See, this reminds me of a little conversation in Alice in Wonderland where Alice is talking to the Queen of, queen of Hearts and um, the Queen asks her, How old are you? And Alice says, I'm seven and a half exactly. The Queen says, You needn't say exactly. I can believe it without that. Now, I'll give you something to believe. I'm just 101, five months and a day. And Alice says, I can't believe that. Can't you, the queen said in a pitying tone, try again, take a deep breath, shut your eyes. Alice laughed. There's no use trying. She said, one can't believe impossible things. See, Alice is a thinking like a Christian, a theist, or even a modernist. But the queen isn't. The queen says, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was your age, I always did it for a half an hour every day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before, Christ, before breakfast. Now, as we close up, I want you to think about this. If you train your mind, as postmodernists have done, through the influence of their culture and buying into all of this, to believe six impossible things every day, then when 30, 40, 50 years has gone by, You can't tell the difference between possibility and impossibility anymore. And you're left thinking in a way that is so foreign to someone who believes in external absolutes that you might as well, that that the two people may as well be talking in completely different languages. One One would be talking Hebrew and the other would be talking Japanese. They can't understand a thing that the other is saying because. The foundation for meaning has been uh, has absolutely been er- eradicated and annihilated, and that's where we're headed as a culture. And that'll only lead to more hostility and more aggravation. Now, a lot of Christians, as I said, fifty three percent of evangelicals don't believe in absolute truth. And if the way you live indicates what you believe, academically we may say, I believe in absolute truth. But how many of us experience the fact and catch ourselves at times thinking in terms of a relative system simply because that's the heartbeat of our culture and we have to stop ourselves? That's how we've been influenced. So we need to contend for the faith. We need to constantly be reminded that there is absolute truth and listen to it over and over and over again. You, you can't just sit back and passively go through life and think an hour of Bible study and instruction focusing your mind on the truth is enough. I'm not even sure six hours a week is enough. But, but we have to have proportion in all things. But daily, there has to be something. Maybe you can't listen to a tape or a lesson an hour a day. Maybe all you have time for is 15 minutes on the way to work, 15 minutes on the way home. Take it. Grab it. Don't say, oh, I'm just going to listen to music. What you just said is, I'm going to let the world influence me instead of the Bible. These are our options. So are you going to contend for the faith in your own soul or not? That's the question. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things. We pray that you'd help us to assimilate them into our own mind, our own thinking, that uh, we may uh, be transformed from the inside out, having our thinking overhauled, not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.